Where are you looking at? I can't fucking see you. You can't? Good. No, I just see this blinding fucking light right here. Just look look toward the light, but don't go toward the light. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Um, I don't feel like I'm loud enough. Is this me? This is me. Okay. What's going on in the news? I don't have a fucking clue. Did you hear that uh, Yellowstone's been evacuated? So I looked it up. It actually appears to be a real thing. There's a bunch of seismic activity where the caldera would be, which I guess is a large surface area of Yellowstone, a big piece of it. Um, but there's a fracture. There's an actual opening that's like 100 feet long, and they said that it's uh, 100 times more likely to actually erupt at this point. Um, and there, there's always been seismic activity. Like the, the surface rose five inches at one point over the last couple of years. Um, but I guess Tucker Carlson came out and said something about it. So I just searched uh, Yellowstone last night on YouTube. And after getting through the first couple of videos, which are the TV show, there was a video that had Tucker Carlson in it. I don't know if, because I, I was told that Tucker Carlson did a video last night um, and said, you know, this stuff about Yellowstone. Now, the video I saw had Tucker Carlson in it speaking about it, but I don't know how recent this is. You know, I don't know if it's an actual Yellowstone was evacuated yesterday and nobody's allowed in the park or, or what the real deal is. I don't know. Doesn't if, if Yellowstone blows, what happens? It kills the United States. The whole thing? Well, it depends how much it blows too, right? Is it a little bit and releases pressure, or is it a massive event? Because it, it is the largest super volcano, I think, in the world that we know of. Um, and then if you watch History Channel, like they have a whole thing on these mega disasters and what would happen. One of them was what would happen if Yellowstone went off. It would put all this pumice in the air, and it's it's a very fine particulate um, that basically causes it. It'll form to concrete when it gets wet. So you inhale that. It's in, the, it's in the air, and when it gets in your lungs, it stays in your lungs and mixes with all the fluid in your lungs. Um, and then they say when it settles, it'll settle on roofs, and you'll have this, you know, several inches of powder. But then when it gets wet, it gains all this weight, and it actually collapses roofs of houses. There was all these um, probably like CGI renderings and such talking about on flat roofs of buildings and stuff like that, they collapse now. I, I don't know. How, how do we know that? I mean, what has happened in areas close to volcanoes when volcanoes have gone off in the last, you know, 15, 20, 30 years? We see these huge things in the news, but you don't ever see, you know, the village or the town 10 miles away. Once that ash settled, did those roofs collapse, right? We don't, we don't really know that. And what happened to those people there? And then also weather patterns. So like I remember Mount St. Helens going off. I was in the fifth grade and my mom gave me, and I don't know where it came from. It could be, who knows what it was, but I have a, a canning jar, a mason jar full of ashes that are supposed to be from Mount St. Helens. Now my mom gave those to me and I don't know, I don't recall what the story was. Somebody she knew had been there or something. And I had them all my life thinking that those are Mount St. Helens ashes, but they are very, very fine it's it's different than a campfire ash but i mean if you look at yellowstone now i mean not yellowstone but if you look at mount st helens there is a lot of footage out there you can watch about volcanoes but i mean it's something how would you prepare for that you'd have to go underground probably um i, I don't really know how you would prepare for that so is it something that you focus on would we be affected here in tennessee what do the weather patterns look like what's the typical air um We've got these major forest fires going in Canada right now. And they've been going, what, for 60 days now? Maybe two months this has been happening? Now, I remember going into Nashville six or eight weeks ago, probably. And you could see haze in the air. It didn't really smell like forest fire. It didn't smell like campfire. But there was something in the air. I haven't ever seen it here. Now, when we left here Saturday, you could totally see it in the air. And that's, there was a weather advisory, and it said that it's coming from the Canada fires, and we're here in Tennessee weeks and weeks later. So, I mean, it's going to have to do with, you know, where the wind blows. So if Yellowstone goes, 
what do you think the reaction from the people on that side of the United States would be? I don't know. It depends which way. And if Yellowstone goes, right, what other seismic activity does that cause? There's, there was a, they've got these tsunami warning systems and they can kind of predict earthquakes now somewhat. And they had said, I, I thought it was San Francisco. There was a huge tsunami warning and they, it was all over social media um, that there was going to be a earthquake between seven and nine on the Richter scale. That's a massive fucking earthquake. Like it would, it could possibly even fracture California is what they were saying. Is that the San Andreas line? That's that runs through California. Yeah. We have the new Madrid fault here, which runs through. Real foot. Yeah, real foot was made from that eruption, which was in the 1800s, um, but it runs up through St. Louis. So there's there's a um, there is another. You can you can watch for months watching History and Discovery Channel mega disaster shows. Right? I don't I don't know. There there's we still have History Channel. I've not turned the TV on in six months, a year maybe. And there are two or three history channels and discovery channels, but they're not really doing history and discovery channel shit anymore, right? It's all like alien shows and shit. Um, and gold mining shows. Is the gold mining show still going? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I watched I a few that, I think there's like three or four of them, though. Right, right. Um, like Walking Dead now, for some reason, Facebook has completely redone everything right when i would go to my facebook app or on the computer i could run john willis or special operations equipment i would just click either one and be in it now i have to switch from user as though i'm special operations equipment and it gives me a complete different feed in my feed now so special operations equipment now has a feed and john willis has a feed well i typically don't post as john willis so i don't maneuver around in facebook as john willis i'm in there as special operations equipment and because they've split them, I don't really have a preference for special operations equipment. I haven't curated that feed. Like I had the uh, John Willis Facebook page for 14 some years now. So whenever I'm in there and I'm, I'm just moving around in there, everything's like generic bullshit. And one of them is constantly Walking Dead. Walking Dead, the TV show, Walking Dead, the fan page. And I just keep seeing this shit as though you're a brand new Facebook user or whatever. So I exit and try to make it so that it's out of my feed, but it's constantly there. And now there's, I know that The Walking Dead has a like three new shows that are starting. The, the la They just had the last episode that ran for 10 years, 20 years, whatever it did. And now they've got the main character in Michonne's going to be a show, and they've got this other break-off show, and they've got uh, Negan or Deegan, the bad guy. He's now like the warlord of New York or something like there's all these shows fucking coming from that. So any, anyways, the, um, there is a history channel mega disasters show. I think it's a mega, I think that's what it was. Mega disasters about the, um, what did I say? Our fault here was new Madrid, the new Madrid fault going off again. And, uh, when that happened, that, that fissure flooded and became real foot Lake. Um, the Mississippi ran backwards. The Mississippi River actually ran backwards for three weeks, I believe. Um, and we had a lot of liquefaction, which is we have a lot of uh, sand around here. And it basically turns the ground almost like to quicksand. And you get tornadoes that actually come from the ground. So instead of them being air, um, they're tornadoes that come up out of the ground uh, and they're dirt and sand and shit. And basically any structure... Uh, that survived back then was all wood structures because they can flex and they can kind of move. Whereas anything that was concrete or stone fell down. And well, we have a ton of concrete and stone and this, this whole thing, it runs all the way up through St. Louis. So like your St. Louis arch would fall down. Your um, city of St. Louis would be just crumbled into pieces. And then you have the gas leaks, you know, so you would end up with a lot of fires and such like that. Um, It'd be a it'd be a massive thing. You'd have people without power for shit a year or so. I mean, it just depends, and what happens at the same time, right? So, if you had that happen, who would come as relief for that? And if you have multiple things happen at one time, like the Yellowstone going off, okay, that'd be terrible. Would it immediately affect us? Probably not immediately. Maybe within a week, couple weeks, maybe. But what else would happen at the same time? What would that seismic activity cause or what would human beings cause at the same time? They always said we could fight 
uh, wars on two fronts, but three fronts would be an issue. And that was always, anytime you heard about briefings or anything, it was always the concern was we're in country fighting here, we're fighting here. What happens that third front? We couldn't fight three fronts. Um, so with a natural disaster like that, who would throw in a man-made issue at the same time? Or, you know, fra factions of government, for instance, silent government or, you know, deep state or whatever, that'd be a perfect opportunity to instill martial law or such like that. And that's like when you listen to those, that they're kind of in the same genre. So I guess it just goes back to being prepared, prepare for all your basic shit. Everybody wants to jump in and, and do the the guns and the zombies and all the weapons and shit, but they have no food, right? Well, the food's great. What if your food is all in one place and it burns down, right? Having all the food, that's wonderful. Having a bunker and shit. What if your bunker floods? Like what if the earthquake destroys that and a water comes up through your bunker, right? So you probably should know how to also gather food, you know? If you had to pick one place in the United States for natural disaster, like if you were to like, okay, that's what I'm prepping for, where would you move to and stay? I don't know the answer to that. Um, natural, not like man-made. No, man I know what you're saying. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Like, California has earthquakes, right? This seems like a great place, except we had a massive fucking earthquake that, like, it, it literally, if you look at the United States Navy maps, like, they have a map from 2020, I think, 2019. There's a map that shows the United States fractured into two pieces, and the Mississippi River divides, like, the United States. So that would probably mean that the... New Madrid fault had gone off, right? What would that do? Um, and looking at that map, we are beachfront property right here. Um, it's it's Memphis is where is really fucked. Memphis and then straight up. So like we're a little safer here according to where that fault line runs and such though. But I don't know, man. I don't know. What's in Oklahoma? There's a lot of dudes in Oklahoma. There's people in Ohio. Maybe that's a little safer area. I don't and then, like, toward my area where there's mountains, like, in the yeah. actual Smoky Mountains and yeah, stuff? Yeah, I always say if we left here, we'd go to Chattanooga yeah. or over that direction. How far are you from Chattanooga? Hour. Yeah, I, it's beautiful there. Yeah. I'm yeah. an hour north. Right. Yeah, I like it over there. So, which one would be worse, Yellowstone or California completely breaking off? Like, I... I People, I think people hear this and they, they just say things like, I need to get out of California. Everybody says it. I got out of California. When I say if I woke up in the morning and California had fallen in the ocean, I would, I would run a promotional code. I'd have a sales code. I, I would laugh. Like literally, if you're still in fucking California, if you're dumb enough to be there, not, not my problem, man. Not my problem. Isn't there something in the news too that Key West is getting taken over by water now? So I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but Key West is actually an island, right? Um, the it's Keys. like the Seven Mile Bridge or whatever. That yeah, and there's several, there's several islands there also. It's not just that island, I believe. I know some people that actually, I think they still live in Key West. Maybe not. Um, I've never been there. That's where the Key Limes come from, I guess. I, I think we grow them other places also. I've been a couple times. Not a fan. No. I read a, or I, li I said I read, we say we read now, but I, I listened to a prepper uh, survival fiction series. I think it was three books that took place in the Key West. Um, that's about the extent of what I know of the Keys. The keys. I feel like it would be good for survival because the only way to it through a car or anything is the bridge. Well, that was, that was it, right? And several of the other little islands and bridges around the areas connect each other. Um, there's some cool history around there. Um, they actually closed the bridge and considered themselves uh, conks, right? They said they were going to secede from the United States, and they actually sent the military down there. Um, the mayor, I believe it was the mayor, had a little airplane, and he was pelting the military from his airplane with um, bread that he made. He had a, a deli or something. And they 
actually made their passports and everything. There's there's actually some some real history to that. It's pretty it's pretty interesting, you know, if you go down that path. But if if the keys disappeared, wouldn't affect me, right? I wouldn't be affected by it. I don't think. I mean, I would rather California fall in the ocean, really. If you if someone forced you, you had to live in California or New York, and you had to. Which one would you move to? California. Or maybe New I've never been to New York, right? So I don't I don't know about New York, but California I think is more do but what you said California, right? The upper part of California is trying to not be part of California. They're trying to secede. So I think I would go with California. I love the big trees and the, the big mountains and such over there. I'd probably go Northern California. Is there a lot of preppers in Northern California? I think there has to be. They, I don't think they're even preppers. I think there's just, that, that's their way of so life, cool. right? Like we always say, um, we call it prepping. Grandma called it Tuesday. Like if you go back 50 years, everybody grew a garden and saved food. I guess to someone like me who doesn't garden at all or anything, prepping to me would mean like getting different stash spots all over the place that I grew up with. Like, that's ideal. Like, That's ideal, but that cause that that requires uh, effort and energy, and not not all, but a lot of the people you meet that are into prepping, they just are collectors. They don't actually use any of this shit. It's all sitting in boxes, right? They've got medical stuff, but they have no training. They haven't gone, you know, they don't know who Chuck Peoples is from Appalachian, you know, Medical Solutions. They don't know who Bear is or Refuge Medical. And even even people that do know, like um, Refuge does a good job of advertising, you know, because Bear has so many people um, on his Bear Independent channel. Um, and he does that morning brief. He just kind of talks about his what his view on current events and, you know, stuff going on is. Um, to the interest of preppers. So he's got, I don't remember how many he had. It was a big number when I heard it the other day. And uh, he talks about refuge medical. So a lot of those people will actionably buy the med kits. But how many of them have actually taken a, a class, right? They've got a tourniquet, but most of them are still in the cellophane wrapper. They've never staged them. They've never put them on. Um, and when the first time you put a tourniquet on, it's not comfortable, right? So... You don't know, and, and especially if you're self-applying that, you have to turn that. They say uh, one more pass turn, one turn past, like I can't stand it anymore, turn it one more. Um, you have to, when the blood stops coming out, one more, you know. So how many guys have all this shit but have never, you know, done anything with it? Would, would you suggest paying for training even before buying a kit of anything? Yeah, yeah. Guys come in all the time for, like, tactical response class, right? Um, a giant man came in here yesterday, just an enormous human being. And he came in. Amanda said he's looking for a belt or something. Tac response is sent him over here. Turns out he had moved here, lives just 15 minutes from here. And uh, he came from, South, I think he said South Carolina, right? And some a series of events have happened. His wife got gun-faced, I think he said at a drive through Somebody came up and actually stuck a gun and robbed his wife at gunpoint. I think it was, I thought he said Taco Bell. A friend of his got shot, and then there was a third event that also involved firearms. So they move, and they move here, of all places. I'm like, how the fuck did you choose here? And I think he said that his wife's family was from here or near here or something. So he's taking class, and they sent him over to get a belt, and... They told him he needs a range bag. And I'm like, look, you don't really need a range bag to take this class. I said, I go, did they tell you you needed pistol mag pouches? And he's like, no, they said I could just put them in my pockets. And that's that's kind of weird. That's not something James would have said. They have all the rental gear. And, like, guys come in here from class and, like, what should I buy? I go, you want the real answer? I go, I'm a ter terrible salesman. That's why I shouldn't even be talking to my customers because the real answer is you should go take a class or two and then decide what you need to buy. I go, I, I'll sell you a wallet. You'll pull it out and you'll love it. It'll be a great wallet, visor for your car. Uh, but the truth is, every dude that knows gear and such, everybody wants that big NSW chest rig. And if we have a 1,000 of them out there in the world, we might have a 1,000. If there's a 1,000 out there, 
probably less than 100 people have actually loaded them and actually put them on. And those are 100 guys that actually use that for a job. There's a ton of this shit just sitting there. They buy it for whatever. They put it on. They're like, holy shit, this is heavy. They go take a class. They're like, I really don't want to load this thing up. And they get a little micro rig or something. It's, it's like, what vehicle do you need? Well, you need a couple of vehicles, right? What pair of shoes do you need? I don't know. Is it winter? Is it snowing? Are we going to the mud? Are we going to the river? It's different tools for the application. And when dudes come in, they're like, what should I buy? The real truth is you should go take some classes and then see what you need. And that's what I told them. I go, I'll totally sell you this tool bag. It's a great bag. Makes, some, makes a good range bag. How much stuff do you want to carry to the range? And what do you picture a range bag? He's like, well, you know, I want to carry my pistol in here and some ammo. And so it depends. Like, you, are you going to get bit by the bug, right? Is the, this taking classes and training your thing? You're probably going to carry more than just a pistol. You're probably going to have a rifle with you also. So maybe you want the large tool bag. But the answer is it changes, and you can have a lot of different gear for other things. If I sell you this and you don't get a lot of use of it as a range bag, you can still go to the gym with it, right? You can put a, your stuff in there. Do you want to put your shoes in there? When I go to the gym... I already have the clothing that I'm going to wear on and the shoes that I'm going to wear. And I'm not carrying a fucking stupid gallon of water and a fucking protein tub. You know, I don't need to walk in the gym with a bag that'll hold four or five gallon buckets, right? I can walk in with just this. And, uh, and if you don't use it, you could always use it as a tool bag. You could use it to carry tie down straps and recovery gear for your trucks. It's, um, the answers just vary, man. And as your education changes, You'll see guys show up, especially to class. You'll see them jocked up with a lot of gear and stuff. And then you'll see a dude, you'll go out on the range and everybody's in gear and everything with, in a rifle class. And you'll see a dude down there with Levi's with mags in his pockets. The dude with mags in his pockets, it's either his first class or it's his 10th class. Like you'd see Sherman out there. Sherman was an instructor for a long time for tactical response. But he'll go out and take a full class with just some couple AK mags in his pocket, one in the gun and totally make it through class, no problem. You see other guys show up with all this gear on their second, third class. They've got body armor and water and all this shit. They typically don't have it after the first couple hours of class once it heats. Now, that's not everybody. There's dudes that show up to class and run like you're really going to run, right? They train like it's the real world. And a lot of those dudes, that's how their whole life is. You go look at their truck, and their truck's, you know, they've got caps to air their shit down. They've got an ARB compressor to air their tires back up. A lot of people go off-roading and they have no idea that if you just lower your tire pressure, it will go, a two-wheel drive truck will go places where an unskilled driver with a four-wheel drive couldn't go just by lowering the tire pressure. It's, it's just trial and error, man. There's, there's people all over the world, and especially if you go back to like the, the 70s and the 80s, even the 60s, <clears throat> there's guys out places in just normal-ass stock vehicles that guys get fucked up with completely capable vehicles just because they don't have skill or momentum or desire. We used to take a 70s Volkswagen Beetle yeah. down these four-wheeler trails, and whenever it gets stuck on rocks, we would have five of us in it so we could pick it up yeah. and move it off of them. Ours was a B210. <laughs> my, my friend Matt had a, a Datsun, and Scully talks about Datsuns all the time, and we would go out in the canyon with this thing, and I had a two-wheel drive Ranger, and we also had a RX-7. I had a RX-7 GSLSE, which is a pretty modified, like, fucking turbo car shit. Um, and we would just momentum. <sighs> just if we knew we couldn't get up the other side, we'd go super fast down and then up. And I actually got the RX-7 stuck, and my buddy uh, Gene came out. He actually listens to some of these videos. He came out with a Toyota, and when he saw it the next, we walked out of there that night. We're just kind of like rally car driving all around out in the canyon and shit looks different in the dark. And I ended up someplace that I should not have been in that car and we were wedged in and he came out with his Toyota and we pulled this car out of here and he goes, holy shit, dude, I wouldn't have come through this with my fucking tank. And he was a, an army dude. He, he drove a fucking tank, you know, in the military. And I remember him saying that he's like, I wouldn't have come through this with my fucking tank. So yeah, it's just, it's. And that's what it is. But the Datsun, we would pick it up when it would get caught in ruts out in the canyon. And he had, we would hang out of that thing um, with an HK-91 and shoot at rabbits and shit. And as a kid, you would scrounge up all your money to go buy a box of uh, 20 rounds of Spanish 308 rounds. And we didn't have AirPro. We didn't have eyes. 
wasn't even on the radar. We were just super excited to shoot this fucking rifle that I, I got for my birthday. My mother had bought it for me, but we were, I was sneaking it out of the house and well, she was at work, you know, um, and we were shooting in a safe direction. We're down in gullies and canyons. There's nobody out there, but we're just shooting at whatever moved. Um, but that was out of a, I think it was green. It was a green Datsun B210, I think is what that thing was. And yeah, when you'd get stuck, and even even as you're, if you're just out there with you and your friend or whatever, when you get stuck, you could really kind of like bounce on it. And as it come up and unspring, you could kind of move it to the side and get some traction. Or we'd always find debris, you know, we'd have a piece of carpet or, you know, something stuff under the uh-huh. tires, stuff under that tire. Yeah. Yep. It's crazy. Like, uh, the difference in cars now and cars even 20 years ago. Yeah. And it's like, I had a Ford Ranger from 94 or 95 Ford Ranger. I had an 84 and my brother had like an 80 something Ranger as well. And his outlasted mine. Yeah. Well, they were made of metal too. Like we just, it, it, like, I can't work on most of the shit that I have here. Most of the stuff here now, the modern shit, it's all concealed anyway. Well, it has the um, appearance of being um, concealed, right? It's just got, like, a fucking cover over all the bullshit. But it used to be, like, you needed three things, you know? You need compression, fuel, and spark to run, and you could kind of troubleshoot things if you knew how those things worked. But, like, Jake drove his wife's truck here to work the other day, and it just sat out in the parking lot and cranked and cranked and cranked. And I'm like, well, it's probably not the battery because it's cranking just fine, right? And I go, man, it's acting like it's out of fuel. Is it out of fuel? And the next day, we he started looking through things, and he found a, a fuse that was just completely melted out. Put a new one in. Um, I think Neil kind of troubleshot it or whatever, or brought a, a reader in. But there's, like, out in the middle of nowhere, if you didn't have that fuse... Like, I wouldn't even know where to start with a lot of that shit. With all the, the modern type vehicles. I don't know. I feel like, uh, like it, with my car, I just hit the dog. And yeah. just one dog at 70 miles an hour. Yeah. It destroyed my car. Yes. But I hit a deer in my dad's Chevy S10, like a 92 S10. I just obliterated the deer and there was just blood on it. That was it. The 92 S10 <laughs> is, all, is all metal. It's a it's a fucking metal car. Um, Austin hit a deer, and it completely totaled his vehicle out. It just crumples them. Like, I was watching, um, the video was about the Broncos. There's a lot of stuff going around saying that these Broncos, if you get in a head-end accident or a, a rear end, it, it literally kills you. The whole fucking Bronco, just tin cans. The they, new ones? Yeah, the brand new ones. They have them against, I think it's a wall, right? And then they run a bus or something into it, run a, a vehicle into it. And it, it just cans up, like, boom, nothing left. And then it showed a bunch of other vehicles um, and how they crumple the front. But basically, the rear passengers are not going to be as safe as the front passengers in some of these vehicles. But they hit them same speed, same type of vehicles. Um, and those the driver's seat, passenger seat is pretty safe. It, it crumples. And that's why they put those accordion zones in there, reduces the energy. And uh, that's that's what I was watching was was that um, there were I think they showed it hitting 10, 15 vehicles. I don't recall it being any vehicles that I own, but I was surprised at how fucked these Broncos are. And I'd been hearing people talking about this and I don't know why I'm even here, probably on social media. But yeah, it crumpled them up and fucking destroyed them. But with that, that's why those vehicles total out because they are not you know, metal. They're not meant to stay together anymore. I know um, even back 20 years ago, Steve Walcott was my neighbor and he was a, a score desert racer, like trophy trucks and stuff. And probably when I was in the eighth or ninth grade, he lived down the street, a couple houses and they had doing the um, Craftsman Cherokee series, the stadium race trucks. And he had two of these trucks that they were building uh, ground up, and they started with these Cherokees. But they would cut a bunch of the frame and stuff out of there because those were crumple zones, and these trucks needed to be able to hit each other. So they just had a, a bumper on the front where they could bump each other and hit each other and not 
destroy those things. But a lot of those vehicles, when they build those out to be race trucks, they cut a ton of that shit out of there because it is crumple zone. It is meant to reduce and slow down the energy to protect the driver, but it'll disable the vehicle at that point. It's crazy. Like uh, if a, a car catches on fire now, it's like 30 minutes and it explodes, you know, like it's just gone, maybe even faster. But like my dad's 1956 Chevy Bel Air, it caught on fire before, burned almost the whole, like, but by the time it was put out, he, like, had it rebuilt within a couple months. Maybe that's because um, your fuel tanks aren't metal anymore. All the fuel tanks are just, like, plastic tanks, right? So maybe those are heating up, releasing the fuel. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, and also, we had a Pinto when we were kids, and I remember, like, I was so scared that somebody was going to hit us in the rear end. They said that all the time. <laughs> My friend Jim Triplett had a Pinto. It was a... Uh, Olive drab. It was just this. My dad's was yellow. <laughs> this was like an avocado green <laughs> pinto. It was a hatchback. I remember. Yeah, I remember it used to that. sit in the back with that big glass going yeah, down. Metallica and Megadeth. Metallica <laughs> yeah. and Megadeth. Everywhere went. I got to pee. I use Afrin. Afrin? Mm hmm. The generic works better. What's the generic called? Equate from Walmart. What's in that that causes that? Something that's probably not good for you. Doesn't it just open, like, the blood, or, like, somehow? Is that what it does? Dilates the... I, I don't know. Maybe. The, yeah, I don't know what it does. <laughs> I just remember in that Crank movie, doesn't he keep using it? Is like, that, yeah, but there was something supposed to... It wasn't supposed to be nasal <laughs> spray in that. It was supposed was to be it? something else, I thought. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, a dude, we, um... Right before we moved here, like a day or two before we took the trucks in and had them serviced, before we drove across the United States, and uh, dude said uh, he had lived in Tennessee for a year and then moved back to California. And uh, he said, you're about to find out what Tennessee time is. And I said, what's that? He said, nobody is in a hurry and nobody has any urgency. And he said, and your allergies. I go, I don't have no allergies. And, man, when we when we moved here, I never had any allergies. Never Nose never ran, never sneezed, nothing. And I, I've never been tested for allergies, but I've assumed that I have allergies here. Um, and, like, Claritin D will clear that up. I could usually use Claritin D for, like, a couple of days, and it would just kind of, I wouldn't need it anymore. But now, and maybe it's because I'm outside more. I don't know. I don't really know why, but. I constantly, my nose is stuffed up and I'm blowing my nose and like sitting here, my nose is a little, I don't know if it's stuffy or I just don't get enough air through my nose. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. When I'm out, when I'm outside, like if I'm sitting, well, I guess when I'm inside sitting, my nose gets stuffy and I could use nasal spray and my nose will open up, but it never goes away, right? But if I'm outside moving and I'm hot and I'm sweating, my nose isn't ever stuffed up. So I don't, I don't know really what the answer is to that. I take a, a Claritin every day. Like a real Claritin, like Claritin D? No, just one of the little Some allergy bullshit. pills, like yeah. a little tiny. It starts with an L. I don't know what it's okay. like. The active ingredient, but it's like ten milligram. Like, and if I don't take that, my throat gets like super tight outside in the summer. My eyes get itchy. I've been like that since I was a kid weird but i don't know if it's different over on my side of the state compared to here it has to be different or at least the pollen would be different right because yeah. you're at higher elevation I, don't know. I, I was also wondering the other day i was like when when you were talking about yellowstone i was like if it floods or if yellowstone was to erupt that would kill like 25 percent of the population right yeah like immediately, right? I don't know about immediately, but yeah, I mean, you're going to get that stuff. They say that you get that pumice in your lungs and it never comes out. So that's something that's, and then it, it just kind of turns to concrete. So it, it's supposed to be for people near it. It is a, a death thing over a few days. I would probably move. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's going to be circular, right? When something like that happens, is it 100 miles? Is it 20 miles? I don't know the answer to that. I guess we could look at Mount St. Helens and see 
what their evacuation area was. Now, Mount St. Helens was pretty rural when you look at it like 50 years after the fact. I guess it has been, hasn't been 50 years, but 40 years ago or so, you can kind of see that. Now, we are much more populated now. When you have any kind of disaster where they've closed off both sides of the freeway and people start running out of those areas, I think you can see it like during hurricanes and stuff, right? They, they start telling you a couple weeks ahead of time, get out of Florida or whatever. But all it takes is a couple of people out there with a flat tire or run out of gas to bottleneck that. Um, we were coming back from just Jackson two weekends ago. I think it was on a Saturday. We'd run in, had sushi, went to Home Depot, Lowe's, and you know uh, Sam's Club and such. And on the way back, it's usually a forty. It's about an hour. It's about an hour there took us three hours to get half of the way back just because they had closed it down to one lane. And I mean, it, literally three hours to go, I don't know, 20 miles, not even that. And when we got up there, they weren't even doing construction. It literally, they had just closed one lane just because, the just because everybody had to merge over. Yeah. So and you have the assholes that try to drive as fast as they can and then try to squeeze in. And yeah, they, we see those too, or they try to go in the grass in the center. And here in Tennessee in the center, that's usually a swamp. Like you'll see if a, if a truck, get, you see trucks just fucking buried to the axles all the time right there because it, it is a swamp. Everything there, all that water goes there yeah. and all the sediment and everything there. If you, uh, if you had one vehicle, let's say Yellowstone erupts, California falls off, New York gets bombed and Florida goes underwater all at the same time. What's your vehicle of choice? If you have to, like, let's say you can't be here anymore. You got to go. So just with whatever you could carry? Whatever you can carry and the vehicle of choice. You can carry more shit in a bigger vehicle, right? But then a ve bigger vehicle is also heavier. I mean... When you go when you go to like Moab or um, Rubicon or any of those you know famous off road areas or trails, you see all the crazy shit in the magazines and the TV shows and stuff and the the you know the videos. Most of them have a bypass. You don't have to go the crazy way. There's almost always another way. So guys will build these crazy moon looking buggies and rock bouncers. You know, king of hammers type shit. What's the goal? Do you want to go through the crazy shit or do you want to go to the destination and does it matter how we get to the destination? I'm very happy with the Forerunner. It's, uh, it, it's got good cargo capacity in it. Um, and I say that as having always had big trucks, right? I've got a Suburban. I've got an F-250. I've got a Dodge Mega Cab. But I really like that, that Toyota. And it's narrower too, right? It'll go through some tighter areas and shit. You might get some body damage or whatever, but... I don't know. I like I like that Toyota. I was just thinking the other day when I was looking at those Honda CT uh, trails. The little bikes? Yeah, the 125s. Mm -hmm. I was like, there's guys doing like 2,000 miles on these things, like in a trip. Like at Yes, there's also guys hour. doing them on like um, Groms and little yeah. 50s it's and the, the monkey same, bikes. It's the same engine as like the monkeys. And but... Stuff. Are they really doing that on their own, or do they have chase vehicles behind them? Like this guy that was doing it, he recorded his whole thing, and he just did it on his own. He he had a huge crate that he put on the back. He had like a day pack that was like his backrest that he could just go and. And I was like, man, at the end of the world, I feel like something like that, 125, 130 miles per gallon, put a couple gallons on the side, and just try to get somewhere you know <laughs> i remember driving up um california to arizona there were some really steep parts of the interstate and the road out there and i remember you had to when you're driving through parts of the desert you had to slow down um and they had like i remember as a kid they had these round concrete things full of water. So if your car started overheating, you could get water from them and put back in there. I don't feel like that's an issue today, but with older vehicles, I do remember that. And I remember, I don't remember what I was driving or where we were going, but I remember going up these steep parts of the interstate or highway 
and the truck just not having the energy to I, the power, I almost right? guarantee you're talking about going up to where I live, the Monterey Mountain, and it it's four or five miles of like the craziest grade up to get from your elevation to ours. And usually it's like eight degrees difference yeah. because of the elevation and you'll see like, you'll be driving through Cookville, no snow at the top of the mountain, a foot of snow. And it's like, um, we used to have ski resorts up there and they're closed down now cause it doesn't get that like that much snow. Yeah. But, there's still all the lifts going through the mountains and everything like that, like where I live. And every single day coming home from here, every time that I come home from here, piles of trucks on the side of it. My whole life has been that, like just always up that mountain. Yeah, and I like the vehicles I drive currently, I don't feel like it would be a problem with a modern yeah. vehicle, but it was a concern back then. When I got know? my car towed, it, his the tow truck broke down on that mountain. I remember you saying that. <laughs> so those old ski resorts in Tennessee, that's fucking weird. It's like called I, Renegade Mountain. There's a few of them, right? Where Where's the old uh, ghost town at? Ghost town in the sky? Yeah, and the amusement uh, park. Yeah, that's right at the North Carolina border. So there's some... There, I thought there was one around Gatlinburg. Somewhere. It is. So it's on... Lit um, if, if you're... The plane crash... Um, uh, in Gatlinburg. I don't know if, that. So we have a plane a, crash here in Camden. There's a Cessna up in the mountains, and uh, a dad was drinking with his son in the plane and got lost in the clouds, hit it. The plane's still there. When you're walking the trail to get to the plane, if you're standing at the plane, you can look out on the mountains and see Ghost Town in the sky. But, yeah, you can... Uh, so you're... So, so the... You're, so VFR and IFR, right? Visual flight rules and instrument flight rules. So with visual flight rules, you're supposed to file your flight plan. And if the weather changes and you have to deviate from that, you're fucked if you are flying and have to deviate from your... right. So you're supposed to have IFR, instrument flight, which allows you to fly um, through weather and such or up and around like a and blind above. Zone. Yeah. So I would assume that he was not supposed to be in those clouds and he was an IFR, a VFR guy, right? That's what Rob was talking about. Somebody's like, why don't you just take your jet? He's like, because I don't have my IFR yet. So if, to fly that far, he needed to go to Florida. Flights were canceled. And he's like, people don't realize that just because you have a jet, it would still take fucking 15 hours, 20 hours, whatever to go, you know, different place. You got to stop every and refuel yeah. and shit. Especially with a smaller one. Yeah. Yeah. Because he only has like a Cessna, right? Like a. Um, I don't. He he's got two? a very nice plane, man. I think he's on like his third plane right now. Hmm. Yeah, he's got a he's got a pretty high performance plane. I figured he'd have a helicopter by now. He wanted a helicopter, and Andy Stump, I think, talked him out of a helicopter. Like a lot of people, fucking die in helicopters. Yeah, I was just watching that thing of Kobe Bryant this morning. <laughs> so there's the there's a lot of conspiracy theory around the Kobe Bryant thing. There's a lot of weird shit around that. Um, but back to the ski resorts where in, in your town. Is there abandoned shit up there? Yeah, all the houses. There used to be resort homes. They're all done. And craziest thing that happened is uh, maybe a couple of years ago, um, four high school kids were going to buy pot from a guy. They met him on Renegade Mountain. The guy got out of his car, walked back to sell them pot, Shot all four of them in the head. Literally just shot all four in the head, left them there, and just drove off. So, weed, weed's bad for you. It is. It's, it'll kill you. <laughs> so, did they ever, they ever catch the guy? Yeah. Immediately. What was the... Why? You just did it. So, what's up there? You have... Uh, they're starting to build more homes now. There's like old abandoned playgrounds and stuff, but uh, it's like a gated community now. But you can still just drive through. And the and lifts there, are there, and that's about it. But there's not any, like, buildings or infrastructure. No, or, so not it's not anymore. like Chernobyl. No, not anymore. Man, all that, all that shit we drove past for the last 15, 20 years that is just abandoned, it's all gone now, man. All that, like, Printer's Alley down in Nashville and shit. We, we could have been doing this shit 10 years ago. And Dude, everything in Nashville's gone. Yeah, everything. Like, uh, Vanderbilt side of Nashville, it's just gone. There's a bunch of tunnels on over there. 
Yeah, go on the Cumberland Bridge and look out, and you'll see the little shark painted on the hole. Yeah. And you can just kayak through it. Yeah. That's kind of a, it's supposed to be a secret. Oh, that's not anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's, like, people don't know that. Uh, there's a tunnel uh, where the clamshell is in um, the Parthenon Park there. There's some tunnel entrances there that connect to a bunch of those buildings and shit. I wonder how many homeless people live in it. Um, there's a door. There's a, there's a, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I guess if the homeless person can lockpick, maybe. There's a ton of homeless, uh, there is a lot of homeless encampment. It's, it's kind of hidden. You have to look for it, but once you find it, there's thousands and thousands of them all in one area in Nashville. I know, um, in Knoxville, Tennessee, it's called the, uh, Fifth Avenue Bridge. And there's, like, free hot dogs every, like, weekend there. Like, Why? a guy pulls up and just, like, makes hot dogs, like, for people, the homeless. Okay. And uh, we used to get, there's a skate park there called The Spot. And it was, like, man-made by all the skateboarders. And I just remember being, like, 10 years old and hundreds of homeless people around us there eating hot dogs. And we're just over there eating with them and skating with them. And really weird area. <laughs> weird. Weird. <gasps> So we're recording this on Thursday. Brandall's town had uh, some crazy weather and tornadoes and shit, possible tornadoes, uh, yesterday. So we didn't record yesterday, and then today Jeff's got some some dental or something. So Brandall's here. We're shooting some video today. Um, so there's not a Pulling the Thread podcast this week. Um, somebody had asked something about um, green and OD material we can just make this as a complete second video or roll this in or whatever um when we started building gear i was buying fabric from a place called ufo which was kind of down by the border and it was san uh maybe san ysidro it was uh upholstery no it wasn't it was national city upholstery fabric outlet and it was a big building um <clears throat> much bigger than mine. My building's 10,000 feet. This building was a lot larger. <clears throat> but they had Cordura in there, and they had a woodland camo. It was a terrible woodland camo. It's uh, what If you find any old, old photos of our gear in woodland, that's that camo pattern. It was more like yellow and green. It didn't. I don't think it even had any brown in it. But they had a olive drab green, which was much brighter. It was a terrible green. And they had a black, and I think they had a tan color. So we were building stuff with tan. It was like a sand, like maybe instead of 498, it was like 499, I think. Woodland uh Marpat Brown is 4. I don't remember the number. Anyways, all the webbing we were buying um was coming from Sport Chalet. It was uh kind of an outdoor store. Sport Chalets were really cool when I was younger, like in 20s and 30s I, I don't know did i live here in the 30s in tennessee um but it was a big outdoor store and they had a lot of climbing and kayaking and camping stuff and clothing it was enormous some of them were even two stories and uh in the climbing section they had webbing now they had like tubular webbing it's just like um adventure 16 in san diego we bought stuff there also but they had a flat webbing which is actually the same flat webbing that we use still today and it was uh, 17337, I think is what it was, is the, the mill spec on it. Um, but a lot of backpack companies and such use this stuff. Now, they had these rolls of webbing, and you could buy it by the foot. But if you bought enough of it, and we were going in there and buying, like, all they had constantly. And then finally, somebody's like, hey, we'll give you 10% on this. So we just kept buying it. Um, and there was no internet back then. So one day... Somebody sent me a credit card. I had a credit card. And it, I don't even, I think it was like a $500 limit or whatever. And we found a place in Chino, California that sold Velcro and webbing. And we go in there and I never did see the warehouse either. I remember them sit, put, they put us in a conference room. And I'm like, okay, I want, I had samples and I'm like, I want this stuff. And they brought a, a roll or two out of this stuff. And they're like, okay, this is what we have. And we bought, materials from this company for several years until we found another company. Um, one day we had bought enough from them that they actually put their label over the other company's label. And I was able to peel off the UPS label. I, I assume they sent it to us through UPS. So I was able to peel that label off and see 
where they were buying it and then called that company. And I was able to do that through history several times over maybe a decade and find the point of origin or, you know, remove the middleman somewhat. But I remember going in there in Chino and I'm like, okay, I want this, 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 and this. And, um, they had it and we were going to, I was going to buy this stuff. And, and then I give them the credit card and they're like, well, we don't take credit cards. So back to square one, you know, and, um, but we originally built everything with black webbing and black Velcro because that's all I could get was black webbing and black Velcro. So when we started doing, when we found where they were getting Velcro from, we were able to get like OD Velcro, but it was still black webbing. It just had OD on there. So in building all that stuff, eventually, and this company's like, hey, we, will, we can get you the green but you have to buy 5,000 yards of it, you know, what they call a die lot, and which means the, they're gonna, the company's going to run this stuff for you. Um, really looking back, they were just going to bring it in for you or whatever. They weren't making it. But for our product, for instance, you had to have one inch, inch and a half, and two inch webbing, and then the same in Velcro. So you had to have the, the Velcro, the webbing in all three different sizes, and sometimes we used even other sizes. So that's $5,000 in one inch webbing, $5,000 an inch and a half webbing, $5,000 in two inch webbing. So by the time we're done, we're like 30 grand into this just to have color matte shit. So for a decade, probably we didn't do any of that. Um, and that's why everything was black. And when, when I first started, we were like just stealing webbing off of things. Like it wasn't even on the radar where you would go buy webbing when we built the very first products. The first buckles um, came off of shopping carts from Target. Like where I lived in San Diego, we didn't even have a Walmart, but they had just put all these, the, the seat belts on the shopping carts was a new thing. So um, a buddy of mine went and stole all of these buckles and some of them had, like, some of the webbing. They were just cutting them. And I'm like, hey, get the longer pieces of webbing. Like, you're cutting this off? Bring me the webbing. But the webbing on them was so shitty. It's just almost like you could hold it up and see light through the webbing. It's this polyester webbing, just terrible. And uh, it didn't really do anything. If you looked at the shopping carts, you didn't, like, clip your child in and then adjust them. The webbing was so shitty, it's like you clipped it in and the webbing was twisted and it might have been as well just been cordage or rope or something. Um, but the, the very first gear we made had those just trash buckles. They were super square and just junk. You could probably really just crush them in your hands. Um, and then you fast forward <clears throat> and then we found other you know vendors and manufacturers and such and we went to... Um, different trade shows and there'd be people there and you'd ask, we would just, I'd even, ask, I'd walk up and ask other companies and uh, at Soldier of Fortune show, the first time we walked in there, we actually stole a table. Um, we walked in the side, but when we walked in there, Eagle was in the front. They were a big show sponsor and he had, I remember he had like red carpet. It was the red carpet area. And he had a, a just a massive booth, it, you know, looking back at it, we had booths just like that you know, in the future. But I remember walking up to John Garver and um, just kind of looking around. He's like, can I help you with something? Can I help you, son? I think is what he said. And I said, uh, I'm, I make some gear. I go, you have no idea who I am, but I'm going to be your competition one day. And looking back, that was kind of an, uh, maybe an asshole thing to say, but he just kind of like, I didn't mean it as being an asshole when I said it, but he, he's like, Let, let's talk. And we just walked around and he's, and I'm, he told me some things. He spent probably two hours of his day with me that day. And, uh, I remember him asking, I remember asking him where he, they make this little clip for this silent closing device. It's a piece of webbing and this clip comes under there and it has a piece of elastic and you stretch it and it catches this and then puts tension. And I remember asking, the last thing I'd asked him is where to get that. And he goes, I'm not going to help you compete against me, but if you look around, you'll be able to figure it out. And to this day, I still never figured out where those came from. I see people using them, and I have no interest in even using them any longer. I've got something that I like better. Um, but he talked to me for a long time, and I talk to guys now. Like, for a long time, it was kind of the gatekeeper, and I never could have been, well, I guess I, guess I was kind of competition to him. Whenever he would come into town when I had my other shop in Oceanside, he'd stop by and we'd go to lunch and, 
I actually was a dealer for Eagle for backpacks. Like we weren't building day packs or anything. We brought in a lot of uh, uh, Eagle day packs and 3A packs and Becker patrol packs and rifle cases and stuff. We didn't build any of that stuff in the early days. And uh, we sold a lot of that shit and Surefire lights and stuff like that. But uh, he never he never told me where to get the material from. When the internet came on the scene... I remember searching at, you know, when I lived at my mom's house where I started the company out of her garage. She had internet there, and I didn't really know anything about internet. But when I finally first started sitting down on the internet, it would take forever for anything to pull up. But I was searching, like, Cordura and things like that. And I don't think there was any, like, crawler or anything that just data mined shit back then. So it had to have been put there with key phrases and terms and shit looking back at it. But... I don't know where, when we finally got the materials, I don't know how I got the information as to where we got the materials. But nowadays, you just type in Cordura. And, you know, there's there's groups and um, web pages and forums and stuff is how it used to be now, everything's social media. But people have it so much easier. It took us 10 years. And finally... Like we bought enough of these things and actually did buy dye lots that the companies that we were buying them from actually uh, warehoused it because they charged us so much. So they probably got three times what we got. So they had it on the shelf. And now the, the competitors at my level were literally able to buy materials because I made enough money to bring them in through those companies. Um, but now you see some of that old gear that we had sold originally. A lot of it went to Japan, and now some of it's trickling back over here. Some of it stays in Japan. But if you look on eBay, you will see the original old gear with that ugly-ass woodland camouflage or the uh, OD black stuff, like the original stuff. It sells for, like, huge money. Like, we were we sold those vests for, like, 200 bucks back then, and I see those vests sell for 1200 to $2,000 now. Um it's just, it's weird. So we, we get a bunch of people show up and a lot of it's like, um, we used to airsoft, right? You'd hear all the, the gun dudes would talk shit about the airsoft kids, but a lot of the airsoft kids spent a lot of money and time in that. And a lot of those airsoft kids grew up and became real dudes. Like I had kids walk in my shop that were like 16, 17 playing airsoft, went in the army, went to the Rangers and, you know, had a whole military career. Um, so you never know what somebody's going to become, but they would always talk shit about the airsoft kids. And now it's like, uh, like cosplay and stuff. You, we have SOE gear in a lot of video games and those video games, people play those characters. There's a character I think is called chunk or something in one of these games. And he wears SOE gear and, uh, Tom Clancy had a bunch of SOE gear in uh, Ghost Recon 2 and different video games. So, or an escape from Tarkov or Tarkarov or somewhere. Like, I don't, I, I've never played any of these games, but SOE gear is in them. So we get emails like, hey, will you build this thing? Well, we, we've brought some of that back, right? I had not built like a 500 IV pouch in shit 20 years because that's, that used to be the medical kit, but it's not how people move nowadays. So, these kids want this thing. So we build it <clears throat> and I modernized it a little bit, right? I put a different pull tab on there and different things. And they're like, I want this, but I want it built just the way you used to build it the old way. And I, I won't do it one off. I, I will for a price, but they don't want to pay the price typically. So we actually build stuff again in OD black. People just asked for it. We built like a, Somebody paid enough for me to build it. We built a few extra pieces of it, and it just started a feeding frenzy. So, like, currently today, I just grabbed some OD black stuff. I've got a, I've got a tool bag, a triple pistol mag, and we've built all versions. We make four versions of every pistol mag pouch. Um, we do a single, a double, a triple, and a quad. But when I say versions, I mean fast text closure or Velcro, belt attachment or pals on the back so that's four versions in each color for all four sizes um and then i've got what do i have back here i've got a large tool bag a grocery bag and a small clothes bag and those are things that just were sitting on the shelf that you could buy right now they're they're on the website you can order them they're in inventory um but it's it's just a trip everybody like can you do desert can you do black can you do this and the guys you like 
I think people, especially now, right? You're not going to just out of the blue get a bunch of people to ask for the same thing. People maneuver in the same crowds. They have the same interest and social media targets to them. So they might be in some group or something. When I get a dude's like, I ordered this thing, where's my thing, right? I don't ever get one dude asking about it. It's always multiples at the same time. And like we used to, uh, we would see it happen. We'd like get over a weekend, we get orders for like 20 shotgun rigs. And we always knew somebody, and back then it was somebody was talking shit someplace. Somebody was mad we had canceled an order or whatever. So they went out and talked on, you know, one of these groups or something. Well, it's eyeballs. For every person interacting and talking, there's a hundred set of eyeballs. And a lot of these guys would be like, man, this is the coolest shotgun rig out there. I'm going to order one. So I would actually email them. I'm like, hey, I've got about 20 of you guys that, you know, ordered this thing over the weekend. How did you find out about us? And they would always send us a link and it would always go back to a disgruntled person. Somebody thought they were going to damage us or warn people. And people were like, yeah, but everything this guy posts is like this. He's always mad at somebody every week. And that's kind of how the, that feeding frenzy, that mob mentality was. And it, it really drove a ton of traffic. And that's how the color thing is, too. For a long time, people would just buy whatever, the, the black and green. And then when we started building black stuff. But I've got a piece of kit inside that's all spray painted with multiple different layers of spray paint. And a guy walked up to me a few years ago at Blade Show and said, hey, I want you to have this. I bought this from you as a young Marine right as we were about to deploy. And then I used it, came back, went to another unit. He did a lot of different things. It passed hands, came back to him. And it had been on like 20 different deployments with guys from uh, MARSOC and Force Recon and Battalion Recon and, and stuff like that. And when the war first kicked off, the Marines were flooding in the shop over, you know, a couple weeks, weekends, and we sold everything we had. And then the SEALs came up from Camp Pendle up to Camp Pendleton, and they came in, and they're like, I'm like, I don't have any, you know, desert gear. I don't have anything in green. They're like, we don't give a shit. We're just going to spray paint it. And that's the difference. The guys that are super worried about color match and shit, the guys that really need the gear, they were just spray painting that shit. Um, they would just lay it out on, on the ground and just apply the color that they needed. Um, but when you start dealing with the general public, people, it, it's a different mentality. Um it's, it's the guys that are going to clean and detail their car every day. But once you get those first uh, scratches from the side of the, the rock or the trees, you know, you kind of stop washing that side of the truck as much. You just don't care about it. You're going at why you or brought back OD Green. I don't know if I brought it back. We, you could always kind of get some of it. Um, people people grumble, you know. If, if you just ask for something, you might be surprised what you get. Hey, can you do this? Yeah, we'll do it. How many, you know, or, or I like when guys are like, man, everybody wants this thing. Will you do this? I'm like, sure. How many of everybody is there? How many are you? Right. Well, I'll, I'll take one. Okay. Well, you get, get 10 of your buddies to email me tonight and we'll put them online. You can order them. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But typically if you just send an email, let us know what you want. And if it's something that we can, you know, sell some of, we'll, we'll do small runs of them. We'll, we'll run them up. 